Hi again, Dr. Tony here with our final installment, picking up from the last time that we met. Uh, I'd like to once again share our screen and we will be dealing with the last person, uh, Yuri Brenner. So let me just get to him. All right, and let's share. Let us Share screen. You are now sharing the screen. All righty. All right. Let's talk about Brenner and the uh, ec ecological system. Okay. Uh, and then this should this should pretty much close things up. We started talking about systems theory and uh, the ecological system. So, real brief, the ecological system uh, deals with the environment. Okay, it deals a great deal with interrelationships among subsystems in the environment and how these different systems are shaping the development of the child. Now, what do I mean by these systems? You know, uh, environmental systems. Well, uh, we, ha we have the, the family system, first of all, how the child interacts with the immediate family, surroundings, mom, dad, siblings. Uh, as an infant, we take a look at that and we break that down into how the child interacts with the immediate surroundings of the child, uh, the hedonistic center of the child. I am a child. I am self-centered. I'm here. I've got my toys to play with. How I interact with them. Uh, am I kind to them? Am I nice to them? Do I eat them? Do I punch them? Do I throw them? Do I rip them? Do I chew on them? What do I do with them? And then what do I do after I'm finished? How fast is it that I get bored with them? Uh, do I care for them like like I would care for for somebody that I love and care about? You know, all of these things is what we're looking at in that type of subsystem. And then we have another subsystem, you know, that deals with the child's interactions with parents, and then the child's interactions with society, and child's interaction with. And we'll learn about these uh, down the road. So what Roth and Brenner was looking at was the environment in a whole and how biologically they influence the child, their thoughts, their, their, their thinking processes, uh, their, their morals, their folk ways, uh, the, you know, their, their social interactions, all of this. How does the environment affect the child? And how does the environment influence the child and child making decisions? For example, if a child is traumatized, right? A uh, child is beaten up at home and there's a great deal of trauma involved. Uh, how does that affect the child's behavior in society, interacting with other people, interacting with society at large, interacting with themselves? All of these things Broth and Brenner looked at. So he has this thing, his ecological model, which breaks it down into these systems, the microsystem, the mesosystem, the exosystem, the macrosystem, and the chronosystem. Okay? So if we look at the picture uh, in the screen here, we will see all the way in the center, the micro system. There's a little baby sitting there, you know, with the, his or her hands folded, right? So the micro system is basically that part of the environment that the infant is involved in by themselves. It's a very self-centered, hedonistic. The word hedonism means self-centered. A very hedonistic part of of the baby's environment and the activities involved and how that baby interacts within that immediate environment. But it's not just the kid sitting in the middle of a room. That child's environment, that hedonistic self-centered environment, how that self-centered environment reacts with the parents. How does the child get their needs met? Um, what does the child do? How do the parents interact with the child? The child's in preschool. How does that little infant feel at the preschool with the teacher, with the other students? What, what's that, that child doing? Uh, is it sharing toys, not sharing toys, yelling, screaming, taking tantrums? What's that behavior like? You know, with, with, how does the child get friends within that type of environment? Anything that is dealing with the self centered environment of that child is known as the micro, right? Hedonism, me. Uh, what what I, the child, you, the child, the child is not interested in how 
that interacts with the child, but how the child interacts with that. Once we get a hold of that, once we understand the micro system and how that works, it then moves out into what's known as the mesosystem, right? We look at the mesosystem, we take a look at the micro system and we expand it. And we want to see how the relationship among all of those entities, school, the parents, the friends, the surroundings, all those interactions with teachers, uh, daycare providers, how that affects the child. Now we're starting to look at how that uh, outside system, um, that child gets attention from that, from that system, how that child manipulates those systems to get what that child wants. Now, don't think of the word manipulation as something bad. We all manipulate in different ways. It doesn't mean that we're trying to get something over on somebody. Sometimes it does, but most of the time it doesn't. When I say manipulate the system, what I'm talking about here is how that child uses the system to get what they their needs met, to have their needs met. Uh, and this is expanded because now the child, besides being self-centered, there are much other people that are involved. You know, they take a look at not only what they can get from mom and dad, but they see mom and dad interacting with one another. So now they're giving attention to one another, and now little baby Bobby wants attention from mom or dad. So how does little baby Bobby get attention from mom and dad in that system? If little baby Bobby is in child care, right? Now child care has got a teacher. Male or female, doesn't matter. It's got a teacher. So now we're dealing with somebody that's not mommy and daddy, but yet <clears throat> there's something special because when that big person talks, you know, we have to do what that big person tells us to do, just like mommy and daddy. But now, <clears throat> along with that, there's other things. There's little kids here. So how does the little infant in this micro system deal with other individuals, teachers, and playmates? So we see here the development of interpersonal interactions with other people, right? And Brennan takes a look at this and starts to say, okay, we want to observe this. From the very hedonistic microsystem where the child is very self-centered, now other people are getting involved here and the child needs to learn how to manipulate that environment. And it extends out to the neighbors, the neighborhood kids, and all of this. Uh, so we're taking a look at that mesosystem, the relationship among the entities involved in uh, the child's microsystem, how that child interacts with them. From there, Brothenbrenner moves out of the mesosystem into the exosystem, as he calls it. Now, the exosystem uh, is, is things like social institutions, um, you know, that affect the child's interaction. So as we're looking at this exosystem, we're taking a look at maybe uh, an older child that deals with community health services that got to go to the nurse and, and how that interacts. Extended family members, right? Uh, grandma, grandpa, maybe a daycare uh, worker, somebody in the workplace, friends, neighbors, okay? Uh, as the child starts getting older and starts developing outside of themselves. So now we have this hedonistic child sitting there saying, now how do I get my needs met? How do I work this? outside of this, uh, where I can, uh, I'm learning to, to meet the needs of other people. So geez, if I'm working in this exit system and I do something good for somebody, they get to do something good for me. So there's a payoff to doing something good. If I do something bad to somebody, they do something bad to me. Hmm, that's a payoff too, but in another direction. So what Brothenbrenner is looking at in the, in the uh, uh, exosystem, it's how this child, now no longer an infant, becomes not only not necessarily hedonistic, but altruistic. This is where the beginnings of altruism start to come in, where you start to do things for other people, but still in a very hedonistic way to get your personal needs met. So how does that happen? And how does the media, how does mass media affect? So now we have a child that's looking at mass media, looking at television, look, listening to the radio, listening at different things. All of this stimulus is coming in and affecting the child, affecting this, this little subsystem, if you will. And the child is learning how to interact, not necessarily uh, through 
uh, media things, but now through models, television models. So if you see something on television that's very violent, you know, watch the violent movie. And, uh, you know, people see this thing. How's that, how's that going to affect the child in this exosystem? How's that, how's that going to shape the behavior of the child um, in one way or another? Community resources, for example, the child goes out and starts to interact, maybe goes to the YMCA, uh, maybe goes to some type of, of a daycare center, a child care center, or some type of neighborhood play area. We want to take a look at that child to see how they interact with other children. Uh, are they going to be selfish? Are they going to be bullied? Are they going to be manipulative? Are they going to share? Are they going to play nice with one another? Uh, all of this stuff. Now, the development of that behavior comes from the interactions from the mesosystem and the relationship that this child has and the interactions that this child has with all of the environmental stimuli that the child is has experienced within that system. And that comes from the again uh, uh, inter uh, inter um, actions into relationships as a hedonist in the micro system. So all of this starts to flow together with Prof and Brennan. So let me just take a look at those three systems before I move on to the next one. For the micro system, we see this hedonistic child right there, just trying to figure out who I am, where I am, where we're going and how I can take my environment and manipulate it. You know, with my immediate surroundings and the right here and now, wherever I am, what can I get for me irrespective of everybody else, right? Very hedonistic, pleasure centered, right? Now, if we take a look at, at Freud, we can also see where this ties in with the oral, right? And, and the, uh, <clears throat> the oral system, right? And also take a look at um, behaviorist and how this ties into Skinner and positive and negative reinforcements. So this is where the child uh, starts to learn and starts to develop positive, you know, things that are good for me and things that are bad for me. And if I do certain things a certain way, I get reinforced in a, in a good way. If I do things a different way, I may get reinforced in a bad way, right? So this is where this comes in. Also, if you take a look at Lorenz uh, and, and his, uh, his shaping, uh, right, with the, with the geese and the duck, right, and all that modeling stuff. Well, this is where this comes in because here within these within the system, the child starts to model behavior. It starts. To... So this is also, if we take a look at attachment theory uh, in this in the micro system, that micro system, we see that this is also where the child starts to learn how to be attached or detached from things like uh, other people outside of themselves, and or depending on the environmental system how they become detached from things like their emotions, huh? from their emotions, from their affect, from their feelings. This could be the beginning at this point, depending on the uh, environment, onto dissociation, dissociation, dissociative identity disorders. It starts from here, right? And then we move into the mesosystem. So once we get an idea of how the child is working hedonistically and getting their needs met or not met in the microsystem, we move to the mesosystem and we look at those relationships among all of those entities and we see how this child is starting to develop in relationships now. So now the child is starting to pull out of who they are as a hedonist and starting to, well, maybe I could do certain things and relate to certain people a certain way. Um, you know, here, let me see what this looks like. How can I get a little bit more involved? Still not fully shaped because that comes in the next system the exit system. In the exit system, we now are starting to deal with what we call social institutions and how they affect the child indirectly. How do things like relationships amongst two people, mom and dad, grandparents, uh, caretakers affect the child and how does the child get their needs met? Community services, when the child goes to the doctor or, or some type of agency that deals with, with community, how does that affect child knows they're sick. So now instead of mommy taking care of them, they go to the stranger that, you know, may help them or hurt them. Maybe the kid needs a shot, needs a needle in the exit system. Child's never had that before, right? And now all of a sudden, now the child has to deal with this and understand that this little thing called the needle that, that this guy or gal is giving to them is going to help them. How, does, how do they deal with that? 
How is that dealt with in the family system, right? Friends and neighbors. How does this little child now that's starting to get out of themselves as a hedonist move out into and interact with their friends and neighbors? Are they able to share? Are they nice? Are they not nice? All of this stuff. And then, you know, uh, it just builds from there. So how do they interact in the exosystem, right? How does it flow from the micro to the meso to the exo? Well, then from there, it goes out. It goes out to the larger system. And according to Braff and Brenner, this next system, it's called the, the macro system. Macro system is a broader cultural value-based system. The child's now older, adolescent, right? Possibly young adult, uh, out, out of grade school at this point, maybe towards the end of grade school, middle school, whatever it is, right? So at this point, now the child starts to interact directly into the environment. And this is where folkways and mores are developed. The child now starts to become opinionated, starts to use a little logic a little bit better and seeing how other people interact. Uh, peer groups start to form here, uh, you know, in the, in the macro system. Political views start to form here. Uh, racial prejudice, prejudices, discrimination that have been built in from the micro, the meso, and the exosystem system get acted out or here, right? If the child has been abused, if there's any type of trauma involved or complex traumas involved from the micro, the meso, and the exosystem, system, we see them a little bit more prominent right, in existence, in the broader cultural values. How do they interact? How do they interact with the laws? Roth and Brenner takes a look at this, and this is where the, the child starts to develop uh, different types of views and starts to develop their, their morals. You know, what is morally correct? What is morally incorrect? What happens when I, I obey laws? How are they structured? What happens when I disobey laws? What can I get away with? What's the payoff if I can get away with these things? What's the punishment if I do something that I shouldn't do in society? What happens if I have a relationship with somebody and that relationship goes bad or I do something and it hurts somebody? What's my reaction to that? Or I do something and it helps somebody. You know, how, how does that affect me? This is all macro system, the broader cultural values, law, governmental resources, uh, customs, cultures. How do I start to interact with these cultures? Am I going to be isolative? Am I going to be racially prejudiced? Am I going to hurt people because they don't look like me, think like me, sound like me, talk like me? Am I going to look at society in general and say, oh, this is what happens in society and, and this is the way society acts towards this culture. So therefore it's got to be right. So I'm going to do that. Or am I going to take a look and say, wait a minute, this is the way society is acting with this culture or this person. They're different from me and this isn't right. I can't act that way. So here the decision-making process in the macro system and the values start to come out. And that with Brof and Brenner flowed into what we call the chronos system. It comes from the Greek word chronos, which means time, a time, right? Uh, the, the chronos system, man's time, right? So time changes. So in the chronos system, we look at changes uh, which occur during a child's life. So Brof and Brenner would take a look at this and study a child from birth to this stage over here in a longitudinal study. A longitudinal study is basically a very long, complex study uh, that, that a person does and looking at, at a certain area in a, person's, um, in a person's life over the long term. So usually longitudinal studies go seven years, 10 years, sometimes a lifetime, as opposed to an individual study, which is done just in the present in the short term. In the short term, you have a longitudinal. Anyway, getting back to subject, we're taking a look at the chrono system. So how does everything that the child and now the adolescent, now the young adult has experienced from the birth to this time, how do they interact with it? How are their folkways and their mores um, um, developed? What are their belief systems? 
Are their belief systems good, bad, or indifferent? No judgments here. What are they? That's all we're looking at here, right? Uh, for example, let's say it's an older child and they've been an, an older only child for years. So then mom and dad decide to have another one and now they have the talk. And they sit there and they say, Johnny, come here, sit down. You're gonna have a new brother or sister soon. Johnny may not know what that means. And then all of a sudden, you know, mom and dad start to prepare a different room and Johnny's looking saying, I wonder what this is all about. Is this for me? Still being very hedonistic, very self-centered. It's gotta be for me. And then Johnny goes into the room and mommy says, what are you doing there? Well, I'm playing in here. That's not your room. Come on up. But I thought, no, that's not your room. We'll talk about that later. All right. So now Johnny thinks something's going on here. So then all of a sudden the baby comes. And now Johnny looks at this and sister goes, what's that thing? <laughs> you know? And then mommy and daddy are cuddling, cuddling the baby and, you know, goo goo ga ga and all this stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And then Johnny's looking, and now all of a sudden, attention is taken away from Johnny onto Susie. This new thing. Doesn't see it as a person. sees it as a thing, right? So now Johnny does something to get Mommy and Daddy's attention. Something that knocks off the table and breaks. All of a sudden, Mommy and Daddy look over at Johnny and say, what are you doing, Johnny? Oh, I'm not doing nothing. So then Johnny gets yelled at or some type of, you know, disciplined thing, go to your room, um, you know, give me your telephone or whatever it is. Um, but Johnny got attention, right? And again, this goes back to our thoughts on behavioral therapy, right? Negative reinforcement and also positive punishment. So even though uh, mommy and daddy isn't giving Johnny the attention that Johnny needs, like he used to get. The attention is given to Susie because Johnny did something bad. Mommy and daddy are now giving attention to Johnny. So, just, so the payoff is now Johnny learning that if mommy and daddy are with this thing, little Susie, if I do something bad, they're not going to pay attention to Susie. They're going to pay attention to me. So this is part of the chrono system, you know, or... If mommy and daddy sit there and talk to little Johnny and say, you're going to get a sister, let's talk about this, let's deal with this. And maybe mommy's got a little doll and says, oh, you know, this is how you change the diaper and this is what you do. And all of a sudden they birth the baby and the baby comes in and mommy and daddy <coughs> come home. Excuse me. Hey, Johnny, come here <coughs> and introduce uh, the, the baby to Johnny and Johnny, you know, holds the baby with mommy and all this and they start of the kid and she teaches the kid how to take care of one another so now the child starts moving out of hedonism into altruism right in the chronos so now the the little the child learns how to caretake how to take care of something outside of himself and now the child's environment has grown so now there are other people entities in the environment and now it's a new thing for the child to manipulate uh, to sit there and to get their way in a good way or in a negative way. So that's basic Brennan. And I would encourage you to take a, a look at, at his work and all the other works. All right, so we've been through a lot. So let's take a look at this since this is our last view and let's do a final review. All right. And then I'll just close this thing up a little bit with how all this applies to developmental psychology and also to addictions and what your job is going to be as a counselor and how this fits in. So let's take a look at the 20th century theories. We started off with Freud, with psychoanalytical theory. We talked about his psychosexual model and his five stages of development. Okay, we then moved into from there Eric Erickson, who looked at Freud and said, hmm, I'm questioning these psychosexual stages. Everything may not be libido or id driven. You know, all for the pleasure principle, and because I want to, to, you know, I want to do things right. So we have here. I'm, I'm creating eight stages of development. The interesting thing with my eight stages, Erickson says, is that the the person has to go through each one of these stages, and if he doesn't go through these stages appropriately and correctly to the great outcome, there are consequences that are going to affect the person for life. Then from there, we moved into the behavioral and social learning theories. We started with Watson, 
and we started with his idea of a uh, classical conditioning, right? And how classical conditioning works, right? And we also talked in here about Pavlov and, and uh, Pavlov's dog and how things are conditioned positively or negatively through reinforcements and how things are paired together, P-A-I-R, paired together uh, to, to uh, uh, have a stimulus, have a response and have an outcome. We talked about a, a unconditioned and a conditioned stimulus to give a desired outcome. We talked about a negative stimulus and a negative reinforcement. Uh, we talked about uh, how that fits out to get the uh, uh, individual, the child, to uh, have the target behavior accepted and worked out on. We then moved to Skinner and his operant conditioning. We talked about the Skinner box and how uh, behavior is positively and negatively reinforced and how it's positively and negatively punished and how things like anxieties are caused. Remember the rat in the cage when the rat moved from the white side to the red side and he would get shocked and felt comfort on one side than the other because he wouldn't get shocked. And then all of a sudden at the end of it, what, what Skinner would do is he would shock the, the rat as the rat went to the white side of the box. And then when he ran over to the red side of the box, got shocked again and ran back to the left side, to the white side and got shocked. And that happened until all of a sudden, you know, the rat became very anxious started to defecate and urinate all over the cage. And eventually what that did is it increased the rat's stress, the rat had a heart attack and died. We see the effects of negative punishment or positive punishment because positive punishment, remember, it's, it's good punishment, is the addition of punishment to remove a, a behavior that, that is unwanted. What Skinner proved in, in that uh, experiment was that through... Um, positive punishment, a uh, person gets ultra stressed and it can lead to their to their death, right? Either through biological causes like a heart attack or a stroke, or in some cases, as we see in modern day world, it can also lead to suicidal behaviors. We then moved out of Skinner and out of classical and operant conditioning into Albert Bandor's social learning. And with Bandor, we see how development of the child and the infant into adolescence and adulthood happened by their interactions within society, how they developed socially, how social skills were developed, how folkways and mores affected the individual, how their opinions and how their, their life uh, is, is developed. We saw within the social learning theory how society shapes behavior of an individual and how an individual looks at society and tries to model Society behaviors. We looked here at things like heroes and how a child or an infant would look at somebody that they see as, I want to be just like. They tried to model that behavior and they learn that way. And they reinforce that within themselves. They reinforce that in other ways and they start to discover coming to themselves. From the behavior and social learning theories, we then moved into the biological theories. We started with maturism, maturationism with Hall and Giselle, G. Stanley Hall and Arnold Giselle. In this, we saw how the infant and child and adult goes through different stages and matures at different levels. And how the, the from the infant all the way to the adult needs to go through these different ways and just blend everything that they see from the external stimulus into their lifestyle make them who they are, to mature, where the word maturation, uh, uh, the ideology of maturation, how the child matures through interactions with society, how the, how the child matures through interactions with other people, places, things, and themselves, how they develop there. Okay, from there we went into the ethology model. We talked about Conrad Lorenz uh, and, and how Conrad um, had, the, had his experiment with um, the ducklings and how the ducklings attached to him and how they saw him as mother, father, all this, and how they started to, to develop that way and how people um, uh, survive um, through, through fitness, through their own fitness, and, and how the ethology models have dealt with Darwinism. And we talked about Dr. Charles Darwin and his theory survival of the fittest, <clears throat> and how 
uh, like in the animal kingdom, um, you know, humans will abandon those that that are the weakest, and they will fight for their strength and for dominance. Um, and uh, you know how that all works within within the development of a child, and how a child learns through that. Uh, in in Loran's attachments started how how attachments uh, get on to um, a caretaker and how they just they just put on to that. And then from there, it went into John Bowlby's attachment model and how people, places, things, how people attach to these different things and try to uh, model their behaviors towards that, how important it is for relationships to form and attachments to form within those relations, right? So one of the things that attachment model teaches is how children uh, will latch on to and understand how to be a person by the way they interact with that attachment. So it can be positive or negative. If a child just totally learns that the way to get attention is through negative ways, then what that, that child will do is evolve into an individual that seeks out people um, that are negative influences in their life or not good influences into their life. Uh, and um, they attach to that, and that can turn into severe psychopathology. Um, you know, you'll have a person that constantly can't can't keep a relationship, and they don't understand why. And every relationship they have is an abusive relationship. Well, why are their relationships? What's that about? You know, or every relationship they have, uh, they've got to spoil. They've got to be codependent caretaker. Well, what's that about? Well. The way that they interact with other people ethologically uh, and the way they attach to people, um, you know, that could be the only way that they've learned socially how to interact. And that could be problematic. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way because you also have good attachment, you know, where, where they have a good caretaker. They learn to be good caretaker, not overly caretaking or under caretaking, but just right, you know. Uh, they know when to apply discipline, what kind of discipline. They know when to apply love and caring and how to do that, right? Uh, like like Laurence's imprinting um, with, the, with the ducklings, uh, they learn how in attachment theory, how to maybe imprint, if you will, to use his terms, imprint somebody's behavior onto theirs because this is what they want to be like. And they can do that to success. So these are some of the biological theories, how... Our biology interacts with our sociology and our dynamic. From there, we move out of biology and we go straight into cognitive theory. Cognitive theories, you know, uh, um, we talk about three different theories. We talk about Jean Piaget or Jean Piaget, depending on how you pronounce it, his cognitive development. And we saw his three theories uh, of, of development and how that how those theories of development shaped the child, made the child into what they were from in the infant stages, and what the infant has to do in his three stages of development. And we, we, you can compare those three stages to Freud's stage of psychosexual development, and also to Erickson's stages of development, and see where each one of these three fit in, which would be a good idea. So what I would suggest that you do as a student is uh, either Google, go online, or write out, you know, <clears throat> Freud's uh, five series of uh, five stages of development, Erickson's eight stages of development, and Piaget's three stages of development, and see where they fit together. Because all of these are developmental. All of these show that, that we have to go through different stages, and we have to pass through these stages in some way, shape, or form to be whole human beings and to be able to cope within this thing uh, that we call the world. So cognitive development was Piaget, and then from there we went to see how culture and society affect us. So we have Lev Vygotsky that took a look at this, and, and as Lev Vygotsky took a look at this, he sat there and he said, so let, let me see this, let me see how this works and how this interacts, right? So he saw this and said, well, we have this little thing where children start to have relationships with other children and build on these relationships. And they ask one another to help. I can teach somebody. So if I'm a child that doesn't know what I'm doing and here's a child that knows what they're doing, they come over and they help me. 
is called scaffolding. And as one child teaches one thing that I can teach somebody else and somebody can teach somebody else and you just keep building on what you've learned. So Vygotsky talked about scaffolding that takes somebody outside of themselves and starts to teach them more of how to deal with themselves. So that was social cultural and how, how cultures and how societies start to build and develop an individual. And then we have the information process part of cognitive theory. This is more like a computer systems theory of development, if you will, right? So it takes more of the biological and takes a look at it uh, cognitively. How does the brain work? You know, I mentioned in one of my talks how from childhood to about age 22 to 24, you know, the prefrontal frontal cortex of the brain is developing. During that period of time, you know, the, the child, the adolescent isn't going to be able to make some very good decisions. And during the period of adolescence, uh, you know, there comes that point where adolescents have this thing called the adolescent fantasy, where nothing can happen to them. They'll take risks because they really don't have the right capabilities to make salient judgments, right? So in the information processing period, we focus on things of that nature and, and other things. And we see how information from outside of us, the stimulus of that information uh, attacks us and approaches us, and how we process that information, make decisions based on that. So how society, how people, places, things, events, uh, entities, uh, television, radio, podcasts, whatever, uh, music, words of music, people's interactions, good, bad, indifferent, drugs, alcohol, how we see people interacting with that. If we like it, if we don't like it, we learn to take stuff and put it in and, and make decisions on if I want to be this way. How many times, if you've ever done drug and alcohol counseling, uh, have I'm, I know I've run into this lots of times, where I'll sit there and ask some, somebody, so tell me what fact you started into addictions. And they sit there and say, oh, I saw my friend do this and I wanted to do that. Well, that's a very common thing, but not very smart, right? How old were you? I was, was 13, um, okay? So that tells me prefrontal frontal cortical regions weren't there. The child couldn't make a good decision and thought that, the, that their friend got really messed up and got sick and passed out or threw up or something happened they thought was cool and they wanted to do that to, for the experience. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not into throwing up, but that's all information process. From there, we moved into systems theory. Uh, and systems theory, we looked at Yuri Brothenbrenner. And we just got finished systems theory in Brothenbrenner, and we started to take a look at, at how systems work in the microsystem, the macrosystem, the exosystem, you know, all of these systems, all of these things, right? So uh, you know, we took a look at this, the micro, the meso, the exo, the macro, the chrono system, all this from Groff and Brenner and how those interactions occur. So through all of these things, we see how children develop. And as we see how children develop, we get a picture of how we as adults are the way we are, how we interact, how the stimulus from from intrauterine from, from, from the utero time all the way up to birthing and all the way to the time that we pass away and die, how our personalities were formed, how our belief systems were formed, our prejudices were, performed, were, 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 uh, were, were made, were developed, right? Why we act the way we do, why we make choices the way we make. A lot of this stuff happens through observation, modeling, shaping, molding, practice, reinforcements. We accept the things that we think are going to be good for us, reject the things we think are not good for us. We experiment with the good and the bad. Sometimes we pay a hefty price for the things that we do. You know, uh, addictions, getting somebody pregnant before we're ready to take that responsibility, uh, getting high, getting loaded, um, you know, all these, all these decisions, greed, avarice, anger, frustrations, fear, how we deal with things, how we traumatize ourselves, how we traumatize ourselves. all these things, you know, um, are bombarding us uh, socially, morally, mentally, physically, environmentally. 
So to sit there and say one entity gives a psychopathology uh, is not really true. One thing, a choice, is what deals with um, you know, an addiction. A person is addicted because they choose to be addicted. Yeah, that comes part of it. They choose to be addicted, but at the same time, it could be a biological thing. It could be something, as we know, addiction is a disease. Uh, you know, it could be intergenerational. Again, we take a look at these developmental theories and we see exactly, you know, traceably who in the family was an addict and who wasn't and how that came into being and, and all, all of these different things, all of these different things. So as you look at these different videos, all four of them, I believe I have on, on developmental areas, look at these. And as you move into the rest of this course, you're going to see things like relapse prevention models and harm reduction models and things of that nature. Incorporate those models into this because you really can't understand those models until you understand this. And once you understand how people uh, and, and systems are developed and they react to these different systems and they are who they are by what they've what they've interacted with, then you can take a look at other models and say, okay, this is how I can treat them. Because you just can't treat willy nilly and sit there and say, well, I saw somebody do this and let me do it there. There are no such things as cookie cutter templates for treating either mental illness or substance abuse. But we have to start somewhere. We have to start at the basis. Now, the basis of treatment, at least in addictions and psychotherapy, comes from understanding these developmental models of and understanding them well. So take them, read them, understand them. This was a very superficial presentation of them. If you really want to see the details, pick up a developmental psychology book and read the thing. Understand it, ask questions. Okay? So thanks for, for dealing with this. Thanks for paying attention with this. Uh, if you need me, Get me at a n t h o n y dot s c u d e r i at intercoast dot e d u anthony dot scuderi at intercoast dot e d u. Drop me an email. Ask me for a question. Put your phone number in that email, and the best time that I can call you, I'll call you, and we'll review this again if we need to. Okay. Take care. Enjoy your class, enjoy the rest of it, and please, if you have any questions, get in contact with me. Again, this is Dr. Tilly Scuderi for Intercoast College. Thank you very much for your attention. Take care, stay well, and uh, hope to see you at graduation. Bye.